that God's mercy endures forever. We touched this on yesterday, uh, and it talks about mercy, showing mercy, loving justice, walking humbly with God. We're going to sing that again tonight. You guys did a great job with that. It goes something like this. So we will love justice, show mercy, walk humbly with our God. We will love justice, show mercy, walk humbly with our God. We will love justice, show mercy, walk humbly with our God. We will love justice. Show mercy. Let's make that our declaration to each other and to God again. We will not just show mercy. Walk humbly with our God. We will not just show mercy. Walk humbly with our You and I, here we go. And we will not just show mercy. Walk humbly with Look around to the person next to you and say, not just show mercy. Walk on me with our God. God, this is our prayer to you tonight. Take our lives, take everything we have, we give them to you. Sing, take our lives. Take our lives, Lord. Take our moments and our days. We offer them to you. We offer them in ceaseless prayer. Take our hands, Lord. Take our feet and let them be sacrificed to you. So come. Sing that again. Take our lives. Take our lives, Lord. Take our moments and our days. Offer them to you.
the bases. Raise your hand if you're a bass here. All right. Sing after me, bases. Here we go. Real simple. So justice, mercy, humbly with thy God. Let me hear you. So justice, mercy, humbly with thy God. Again. Justice, mercy, humbly with thy God. We will show justice, mercy. All right, tenors, you ready? Tenors, follow man. Justice, mercy, humbly with thy God. Help us alone. Justice, is show mercy, humbly with thy God. All right, man, go, go, go. Justice. All the ladies, have you follow Ashley over here? All the ladies together. Justice, mercy, humbly with our God. Justice, mercy, humbly with our God. All together, here we go. Justice, mercy, humbly with our God. Justice, show mercy, and we'll come and to you, God, as people involved in urban community development worldwide, God, we want to be people who are following Matthew, uh, Micah 6, 8, God, to love justice, to show mercy, to walk humbly with you, God. We do that not for our own glory, but for yours, God. Good evening. My name is Jim Swearingen. I'm on the board here at CCDA. I'm going to open this up in a word of prayer. Please join with me. 
Dear Heavenly Father, I am just in awe, Lord, that you would give us the opportunity to have eternal life, Lord, to have our names written in the book of life by the grace, Lord, that you've given us. You reached out to us, Lord. We didn't reach out to you. You came and found us, Lord, and offered us a sacrifice to pay for our sins, Lord, that we can have eternal life as a free gift. And we're just in awe of that, Lord. I just thank you, Lord, beyond that, you say that you've made us one, Lord. There's neither slave nor free, male nor free male, Jew nor Gentile, Lord, but we're one in Christ. We're all in one family. I feel that love here at CCDA in St. Louis, Lord. To see my brothers and sisters, one's old friends, people I've just met, Lord, we have a bond, God, of being brothers and sisters in Christ. We feel your love here, Lord. Help us to share that love with one another and to take that love back, Lord, to all the places we've come from, Lord, and just share that with others, that they can experience the kingdom of God, Lord, just as we experience your love to us. Amen. Well, good evening. evening. Hope you had a nice dinner and you got back in time for tonight's session, at least some of you did. I've been coming to CCDA conferences since the first one, I believe, in 1989 in Chicago. I think I've only missed one or two. It's always a pleasure to come and greet old friends and learn new stuff. I started, uh, my name is Larry Lloyd, I'm the president of Crichton College uh, in the heart of Memphis. I started in ministry, there's my Crichton students right there. I started in ministry in the city of Memphis with teenagers in the heart of the city 32 years ago. I relocated before I knew about the three R's of Christian community development, which are relocation and reconciliation. Now you guys almost got it down. Two other guys and myself started a, what we didn't know it it was called that, but we started a Christian Community Development Corporation. It was long before I even got to meet John Perkins. Uh, And I've been involved in Christian Community Development Ministry in one way or another ever since. I didn't know much then. There was no CCDA. Uh, there There were no real models of urban ministry that we could look at. But I did know the Bible. And because I knew the Bible, I knew what the Bible taught. That God was not only concerned about the poor and the disadvantaged, but that God was biased in favor of the poor. And before I had any notion of urban theology, before I had met or read anything by Dr. Ray Bakke, I knew that God loved places and that he loved cities. And that uh, God meant us to love cities as well. And he wanted us to identify with the poor, to relocate in the community, and to be part of racial reconciliation. I knew that incarnational ministry in a place over time was the only way to get anything significant done. So I sort of embraced a theology of geography early on. And I've committed my life not only to Christ these many years, but to the city of Memphis seeking its peace and its welfare. I figure that if I'm faithful long enough and stick in one place long enough, in a place like Memphis, that God will use my gifts and abilities to make a difference, to empower the poor and to empower urban leadership at the same time. In the early days, I concentrated on youth evangelism. But it was quite obvious from the scriptures and from the context in which I was doing ministry That evangelism without social justice and social action was empty. And in fact, as James would say, faith without works is dead. Evangelism without social action is incomplete. Evangelism without social action is evangelism or ministry without a heart. And social action without evangelism is ministry without a soul. The two must always be kept together. Many of us who had grown up in the evangelical parachurch movement like I had had been led, uh, had been misled theologically. The gospel had become so personalized and so individual that there was very little talk and few models of holistic ministry. 
that is ministry that speaks to the heart, soul, mind, and body, and a gospel that can speak to the structures and institutions that oppress the weak and the vulnerable. So we began to rediscover the gospel in those days with the help of pioneers like John Perkins and Jim Wallace and Ray Bakke and Bill Pinnell and Ron Sider, Manny Ortiz, Tom Skinner, late Tom Skinner, and others. We began to understand that the gospel ministry is about evangelism, discipleship, and social action and empowerment. Or put another way, gospel ministry is about leading people to discover that Christ can change your life forever and that the Christ, that Christ through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit can help us change our cities and our communities for his sake. This understanding of the gospel ministry led me from youth evangelism to youth development, then to community development. Finally, to develop the Memphis Leadership Foundation, to city development and economic development through the Hope Christian Community Foundation. What I've tried to do over these many years is to contextualize the whole gospel for the whole city for the sake of Christ. Whether that is in youth development or medical care, affordable housing or economic development, the vision is always the same. How do we lead people in the context of community to faith in Christ in such a way that they are empowered to impact their family, their community, and their city. That is the question that is ever before us in CCDA. This is what CCDA has been committed to since its inception. A commitment to ministry that empowers people and communities beyond the walls of poverty. This sort of ministry is complex. It, at times it's frustrating, and it's at many times all-consuming. Now, we have poverty in our cities, in a nation that has, been, has seen such tremendous economic growth, unbelievable technological advances, exciting medical and scientific discoveries, poverty in our cities is simply unacceptable. Illiteracy is unacceptable. We cannot give up or give in to these, these terrible uh, systems in our city. We must continue on this road to empowerment beyond the walls of poverty. So I've been doing this sort of work for 32 years. But there was one structure, one institution, that we had little impact on. And that was K-12 education in the public schools. Frankly, public schools in urban areas are failing our children. In Memphis, we have 120,000 children in our school system. When I agreed to become the president of Crichton College, I, along with the board of directors, decided to become a college that would address the miseducation or undereducation of our city kids. We opened our doors wide at Crichton to the Memphis community. We are one of the most racially diverse Christian colleges in the nation. But you know what really angered and frustrated me? 48% of my freshmen last year from Memphis City Schools were had to take remedial education. And the overwhelming majority of these students, probably 80% of them, were from Memphis City Schools. In fact, less than 50% of our kids in Memphis public schools ever graduate from high school. The average ACT score for, for seniors from Memphis City Schools is inadequate for college admissions. Yet these same kids in these remedial programs were graduating in the top 25% of their class. They had good grade point averages, that should have indicated that they could do college work. But they were grossly underprepared, many barely reading at a high school level, and their math and science skills were dismal. Now, these statistics are familiar with any of you in urban areas, because this, these statistics could be repeated in almost every one of our major cities and in our poor, poor rural areas as well, all, of, all across the United States. Our educational system in urban America is failing our kids, locking them into a life of inferiority and ignorance while their more affluent counterparts receive an excellent education. Our urban schools have more often than not assumed our kids can't learn. It's a lie. They've dumbed down the curriculum to give them a false impression of success. Our kids don't take calculus or advanced courses. Many of our schools in Memphis, the ones deep in the hood, don't offer any advanced placement courses at all. They don't prepare kids for the ACT or the SAT. And you know what we see as a result? We build jails for the kids that fail. It seems that the urban agenda today is build a jail for those who fail. 
I believe that this is the greatest challenge and social failure facing us in urban America today. In a simplistic sense, the four pillars of American society are faith, family, community, and education, all of which are intertwined. I had devoted my life of ministry to the first three, but what do we do about K-12 through public education? Is it too big for the Church of Jesus Christ? I can tell you this as a college president, we can't solve this problem in Memphis as a college by, by doing remedial education. We simply can't accommodate all the students. We will fail if we try to. We're not big enough. It won't work. Too many of the students we accept on probation are too far behind and we're not going to succeed with them and they will leave us just as delusioned as they leave their high school 12th grade class on graduation. Now imagine how a freshman feels when they got top grades in one of our high schools only find they cannot pass freshman English in college. Talk about despair and anger. They deserve better than that. But here's the thing. If we are committed to empowerment beyond the walls of poverty, it's a theme of our conference, then education is absolutely crucial. So what we decided to do as a college is to impact K-12 educational, the K-12 educational system from the inside out by training, get this, an army of qualified, dedicated, passionate, zealot teachers for Memphis City Schools. We've created a center of excellence. We've created a center of excellence for urban education and we'll recruit 300 students every year beginning on or before 2009 who will teach in our most troubled schools. The issue in Memphis, and it's also true in every major city I've looked at, is this. We cannot find and we cannot keep classroom teachers. The teachers in the classroom, the teacher in the classroom is the key. That is how we plan to empower thousands of students in our city. It's a long-term vision. We will provide a pipeline of highly qualified teachers from Memphis City Schools. And over time, we'll have thousands and thousands of teachers changing lives in the city of Memphis. Because we are an urban college in the city and for the city, our teachers will be partnering with dozens of urban ministries in the city while they are getting a top-rate education. So when they go to the most troubled schools, they will be going with a community development and empowerment mindset. They will get their education in a raci racially and socioeconomically diverse college. And they will be getting that education from a Christ-centered incarnational perspective. They will have the values of this Christ-centered education that values the city and values the poor and the vulnerable and seeks to make, move beyond poverty to empowerment. This army of educators trained in this way will bring a missionary zeal to their teaching. In fact, perhaps the greatest mission field in urban America today is public education. If we are going to break the cycle of poverty, we must impact public education. And the key to high quality education is an army of young people who want to change our city forever. I believe that there are thousands of high school juniors and seniors, even college freshmen and sophomores, who will take on this challenge in our city. And once we test this model in Memphis, it can be replicated in every urban area in the United States. Some of those young people are right here tonight at this conference. Others are in your ministry centers, in your community centers. I want to create an army of urban educators who will empower thousands of young people in our city. This initiative, along with other urban ministries and churches in our great city, will empower the next generation of Wayne Gordons and Noel Castellanos. We will move people beyond the walls of poverty to empowerment. The stakes are high in Memphis, but we cannot fail. Thank you.
great. Okay, okay. Okay. Oh man, this is this is so so wonderful. This is really a, an important time in my life to be standing here right now with all of you out there. When I was first gave my life to Christ in 1957, um, I was discipled by an old Presbyterian elder. He helped me to understand the mission of the church. Uh, and he took that from Acts 1-8. Uh, this was anticipating the church, and this is the last words of Jesus when he was ready to ascend back to heaven. He said, but you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of of the earth. The mission of the mission of the church is to share this good news into all the world. That's the mission. And the church exists, of course, for worship and praise God. And that's very important because he deserves the glory. But the work of the church is to equip the, the saints, the disciples, for the work of the mission yes. and the work of the ministry. And that ministry is that church out into the world, rescuing the perishing, caring for the dying in our society. Yes. And, uh, and so that's the mission. And I want to participate in that mission. Yes. It, was, it was sort of natural that I would uh, grow up in Monrovia, California and ended up being on the board of directors of the World Vision because this old man discipled me in that whole idea, a mission. And I don't see what I am doing when I'm doing it as the end of the world. All of us ought to be participating in somehow of getting this gospel to the next villages of the world. That's what we should do. And I'm here tonight to raise an offering. And this is a unique offering I'm thinking to raise tonight. I'm going to raise an offering for rural ministry. I want you to know that the principles of CC Day developed when we, Vera May and I, went back to Mississippi and rural Menin Hall and started the ministry there. And of course, as the urban ministry, when we started, we was the flagship ministries of the country. But as ministries have developed, urban was not looked upon as a place to do ministry. This is in the last 10 years or 15 years that urban ministry have developed. And it got churches and others reaching into that. And, and of course, the problem with rural ministries is that they don't have an economic base to do the kind of ministry. But it's from those kind of ministries that young folks come that is not yet... Uh, uh, hip hoppers and yet now uh, uh, been so affected by this society and so the possibility of raising up leadership from rural communities in a small town is still a viable work. And so while we are prim uh, primarily, uh, uh, as we look at it, urban ministry, we cannot leave the rural ministries behind. And so we talked about that because one of our ministries is in trouble and needs some assistance. But we talked about that as a board and we talked about it very thoroughly. And we are so delighted that, uh, that World Vision has, uh, has developed uh, a rural ministry component. And that we really want to build that aspect up because that's a neglected era in terms of, uh, in terms of ministry. And in fact, we have the director now of uh, of World Vision USA is, is here tonight somewhere in this uh, building. And I'm delighted she's here. We just launched that whole rural ministry in the United States. So we want to really join with World Vision. We want to join with World Vision as, uh, uh, as an association here and, and see what we can do to really help that rural, those rural ministries as they develop around the country. And that we really thought about it very thoroughly 
And, and we thought about some idea of, of creating some kind of a pool where we could have some resources to be able to help those rural ministries to come along. And tonight, this is going to be, uh, we're going to be our first offering for that, uh, that ministry. And I really wish that you folks would, uh, would, would give tonight to that uh, rural ministry and to that pool that we're going to create in order to help rural ministry. And so we're to take an offering. We finna to lift it off. We we're lifting this offering, and we want to be known as a, as a ministry that is concerned and have a little sense of urgency. I'm afraid that 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 we're losing that sense of urgency. You know, uh, it, the all, the new, the apostles lived with the idea that they had been with Jesus and He was so wonderful, and they lived with this whole expectation all the time of Him returning, and so they had a sense of urgency. We have sort of lost that sense of urgency. And so we, we, want to, we want to do that. Okay, along with that, somewhere, you, I'm getting more, more information uh, here, is, is, a, is a, there's, a, there's a card here. And this card here is, is a card from the, from the Mendenhall Ministry. And I, I suspect that this is going to be the first ministry that we're going to give to in this pool that we're going to gather here tonight. And there is a... Uh, probably we got offering this somewhere, an offering. Did y'all get one when you came in? A card here. And, and, and also you, 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 you fill this out along with your offering and uh, put it in the plate. But uh, this is a very serious, serious offering. And I think this is probably the second time that we have ever taken an offering uh, here for any other minutes. But, but it's going to become a tradition. It's going to be something we're going to do um, year after year after year because we want to join with World Vision in trying to strengthen these rural ministries in the, in, in the country. So what I'm going to do now is pray, and I guess they got it all arranged, you know. When, you, when you're out of thing like I am out of thing now, and it's being run so uh, efficient, it makes me nervous because I don't know what's going on. You, you, you know, and, I, and I'm not used to running anything that this efficient. Uh, before that's 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 the thing. When I I, I spoke I spoke at Brother A R Bernard's church. He's one of the finest churches in the United States. He's gonna be speaking here in just a few minutes. And what 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 both thrilled me was that the church was just so organized. All I had to do is get up and speak. And you're talking about a a a, a black congregation of about uh, the place will hold about eight thousand people. And it was filled for three services there. And it's a predominantly black congregation. And, uh, and we did three services and was out there before 1230. I mean, that is something, boy. That is something. Because see, even, though, even, even, even the white folks that damaged me, I didn't even think that we could do that and get out on time. You, 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 you know. and so, so, so look here. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. And, and let's, let, let's, let's, let's join with World Vision. Let's join with, we are in the city, and you know we have more resources than people in the rural. And I, I, I'm pleading with you, as I say, that you're going to hear this probably uh, a few years from now. Every time we come, we want to reach, we don't want to miss the people in the rural. We want to support them in their ministry. And we want this offering tonight to be uh, something significant. And as I say, they have the pledge cards in here. And if you want to do something extra after this for men in hall, we, they would be so very thankful for that. Let's pray. Oh, okay. You going to pray with me? Okay. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. We thank you, Lord, for bringing these people together to learn from each other and to fellowship together. We pray that you would bless us. We pray for these rural ministries around this nation, the neglected places, the, the Native American reservations and these other areas in the Appalachian up there where we have the really neglected uh, white people in these villages and those coal mines dying from lung disease and we're neglecting them. And Lord, we pray that we as a people here uh, might join together and even the, the, the rural farmers in in, in California and other people who are being neglected. We pray, Lord, 
that you would help us to participate and to help to strengthen the start and to strengthen those ministries in rural America. So be with us now. Bless us as we give. We ask this in Jesus' precious name for his sake. Amen. Good. Before we start, let me, uh, D John, uh, just about introduce perfectly Dr. Bernard, but uh, I want to just tell you a couple more things about him, and uh, he'll come up right after another special thing that we have for you. But he's the pastor of Christian Cultural Center in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, been in ministry for over 30 years. His church has over 25,000 members, but it started like many of our ministries uh, here in CCDA. In his living room with his uh, wife and two children, been married for 35 years, and uh, uh, I've heard Dr. Bernard speak on a number of occasions, and he is a teacher. He's an empowerer, okay? So I know that you're going to have a, a great, great experience. So uh, you all ready for tonight? You all ready for tonight? Now let me, let me just say one thing, uh, and, and I should have said it when John was up here, uh, but a couple interesting things happened to me today. Uh, I was walking around and somebody came up to me and said, brother, your message last night was powerful. Man, I, you, you are deep. And I, you know, they were talking about Robert, right? But I just said, oh, thank you. Thank you. I, you know, I didn't have the heart to tell him, you know, that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, me, that it was Robert that was speaking, the, the Dominican guy, right? And then I was walking around a little bit more, and then somebody came up to me, oh, that merengue song was amazing. I didn't know you could sing. And I said, no problem. Hey, chevere. You know, cool, man, you know. And I didn't have the heart to tell him that that wasn't me, that that was Isaiah, okay? Now, some of you all think that the Latinos are taking over. No, but you, you just think that all of us look alike. That's all it is, right? So uh, we're going to have a great time tonight. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'll be there as soon as I get a taxi. Oh. Yes. What did I do with that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, excuse me. Excuse me, ma'am. Hey, how you doing? Miss, I'm supposed to be in Minnesota. Ma'am. Oh. I'll call you back. I gotta, I gotta call you back. Look, oh, I'm sorry. I don't mean you no harm, ma'am, but I'm supposed to be in Minnesota. But I lost my bus ticket. And I was just wondering if you could loan me a few dollars. I don't think so. Oh, man. You know what? I don't do this all the time. 
But this is an emergency. I don't think so. Oh, man. Hmm. Coach just called 19, pastor just called 19 sermons on who is your neighbor. And here I have a neighbor that needs my help, and I must do something. Look, I don't need but a few dollars. Here, here, here. Take it, take it, and I hope your mother will be okay. Thank you. Yes, yes. See, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, but you know what? I got this thing with my neck. You know, when it's cold outside like this, I got this crook in my neck, and I'd probably be better if I had something around my neck like your scarf. My scarf? Yeah. My scarf? Uh-huh. Oh, here, 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 here. Take it. Just take it. Take it. Mm, this is nice. Look at this here. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay. Mm. But wait, 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 ma'am. You know what? You see this cold I got on right here? It is so enough cold out here. And the wind just be blowing through this little coat right here. You get yourself a warm coat. Oh, no. You know what? Uh, I tried to get down there to the thrift store the other day. I just don't have the time oh, or oh, the here, money. Here, 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 here. Just Wait, take, look take. at this. This is nice. Mm. Oh, and it fit too. Yes, this is nice. Got the scar. Got the money and everything. You know what, though, ma'am? Hold on, hold on, hold on. You know, when I do go to Milwaukee to go see my mama, I'm going to need a bag. But look, look what I got. Look at that. I can't carry my stuff in that there. I need a travel bag. Travel bag? Yeah, I need a travel bag. Like you got there. This? This is not a travel bag. This is a briefcase. Oh, that's okay. I could use that. <laughs> oh, here, here, here. here, oh, here look at here, this. Here. Take, take, take. Take yes. my travel bag. Yes, all right. Now, that's my bag. Mm. Got the money. I'm, oh, I'm straight. Hello? I Hello? What else I need? Yes. Mm. Yes. I'll be, I'm on my way to the board meeting now. Nice. Yes. Look at that. Yes. Okay. I'll take care of that when I get oh, there. That's it. That's it. Miss, miss, that's it. That's, that's all else I need. I need a cell phone. I'm so not call my mama. No more of this nice neighbor stuff. I want you to just leave me alone. All right, all right. Mm. Man, if you're going to be like that, so let mm. me get up out of here. My coat, my purse, my scarf. She just wants everything. She took everything from me. Hmm. That lady really must be hurting. Hmm. She really must be hurting. And Lord, I didn't even get her name. Lord, forgive me. Praise the Lord. Jesse, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Can we give the podium another round of applause, please? <laughs> That's the first time I've ever seen the podium get a hand clap like that. I tell you, you are really there. Good evening. Good evening. Last I heard, I'm A.R. Bernard, and uh, it is so good to be with you. And I have to tell you, John Perkins is a man that I, I've just come to love and appreciate so much. We had him at our church in New York City, Brooklyn, New York, and uh, he did the evangelist thing. He blew in, blew up, and blew out, and uh, just really, really brought a very seasoned and powerful word to our congregation. I am glad to be with you. I bring you greetings from our growing congregation of, uh, we're at 28,748 members, and uh, we are just so thankful. That has been a 30-year road from a little storefront in the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn. 
that's where we started. My wife and I, we started with just, uh, in fact, we started with four members. And uh, God has been gracious to us this January. We celebrate 30 years of ministry. And I'm glad to say that, uh, yeah, that's a good thing, 30 years. And I'm glad to say that uh, 30 years later, I still have all of my original members who are still part of our ministry. And that is a blessing. Amen. And that'll be my wife and my three sons. And uh, I just feel good about that. So if everybody left, I'll still have the charter members with me uh, to be with me. Gosh, what can I tell you that you don't already know? Some of the names that have been shared are men's whose works that I've read and been influenced by. And um, I come from a background of changing communities, not just transforming lives, but seeing society change. It was, albeit a radical background, I was with the Nation of Islam before I came to Christ and uh, had opportunity in 1975 to meet up with a man named Nicky Cruz, who ministered the gospel of Jesus Christ to me. And uh, it literally transformed my life. And the remaining five years as a banker just didn't go well because I did not get the same joy out of the finance industry that I did. So after 10 years, God called me and I left and went full time into the ministry. And it's been quite a journey since then. But the same uh, passion, the same excitement that I had uh, in, in seeing people convert to Islam is an even greater passion that I have to see people not only come to Christ, but model Christ in culture throughout the communities. And that gives you an idea of how the name Christian Cultural Center came about. I'll tell you a story. In 1985, the uh, then mayor of New York City decided that he was going to dismantle what was a clergy liaison office. And he closed them all down. And this is where there were clergy who were liaisons between the community and the mayor's office. And in closing them down, he kept the Muslim clergyman and he kept the Jewish clergyman. And I asked the question, well, what happened? Why did you get rid of the Christians, it seemed, but you kept the, the Jews, Jewish leadership, and you kept the Muslim leadership? And the response really impacted me. He said, because those two are not just religions, they're cultures. And because they're cultures, they have an impact beyond just their religious beliefs. And I said, well, wait a minute. How have we gotten to a place where Christianity has been relegated to a religion? No wonder Church separation of church and state is being pressed upon us so strongly to try to marginalize us so that we cannot engage the culture. And it was at that time I began to look at Christ and look at the kingdom of God as a culture. An integrated system, the beliefs, traditions, customs, ideas, and in our day and time technologies that make up the life of a people. And I couldn't share with my congregation until I could really get some understanding of this. So from 1985 to 1990, I continued to develop that notion of the kingdom of God as a vast culture of people. When I shared it with some of my members, they left because they said, culture, doesn't that have cult in it? And I said, okay, Lord, I'm not even going to try to go there with them. <laughs> but it was brewing in my heart. And then once, once I got a handle on it from 1990 to 2000, 
as God blessed us to grow, I began to teach it and implement it and basically give an understanding that it is not where we get born again, get saved, and then get into our four walls of a church, have worship service and praise the Lord and grow and, and know it's, it's far beyond that. It's about embracing the society. So, of course, in those early days when I was trying to share it with my staff, they said, well, give us an example of what you're talking about. I said, I'm glad you asked. In New York City, the Salvation Army really had a handle on the soup kitchens and feeding programs and whatnot. And it was right about the time of this particular mayor by the name of Koch, but I won't tell you his name. He... Uh, <laughs> It was right about that time that because the uh, Salvation Army would not allow homosexuals to be on their staff, they took a stand. And um, so the mayor decided that he was going to shut down the funding that would go into the soup kitchens. And that was the threat that he used. So the Salvation Army, God bless them, they said, well, Mr. Mayor, if that be the case, you feed them. And they closed down every soup kitchen in the city. And the lines got longer, and the homeless got into an uproar, and it was just a mess. And within two weeks, the mayor decided that he would issue an executive order <laughs> to restore funding. And I stepped back and I said, yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And tonight I just want to share something with you, given these things that changed my life. Would you bow your heads as we go to the Lord in prayer? And you know what? I'm going to be me, so I'll take that board. I'll, I'll take that board. I'll be me. Now, on Sundays, I have a board, you know, during Sunday service, and I use my board and teach. And I try to use it as much as I can. I had one situation where someone said, are you going to need that board? This is Yankee Stadium. I said, you know, I think I can get along without it. But I love people to see what I'm talking about. What do you want to do? Bring it a little closer here. That's great. That's great. That's great. So I'll just be me. Is that all right? All right. Good. I'm, I'm comfortable with this. It's visual and, and, and we can see. I want you all to see what I'm talking about. Amen. So let's pray. Let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this gathering, this wonderful organization that is doing more than personal transformation. They're engaged in the transformation of communities, places, society. Thank you for the vision behind this. Thank you for my friend and brother, John Perkins. And as we are gathered here, I ask you, we realize that no matter how great the teacher, the preacher, the singer, the minister, it's still the ministry of the Holy Spirit who opens the eyes of our understanding and pierces our heart with your word and your will. So bless us as we spend time together to think this through and reason in the scripture. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. I tell my congregation, I said, look, if you invite me to a barbecue, all right? I said, bring your Bible and a notepad. And uh, in our church, I remember even before we got into our present building, we had a supermarket that we renovated, and that's where we were having services. And we had... Uh, we got up to the point where we were having five services, and we had four on Sunday, one after another, and to hold the people who were online, because the building only hold about 1,300, we squeezed 1,300 in there, we actually had a warehouse that was the first stop. And while you stood in the warehouse online, we gave you tea and coffee and water and whatever. And then we outgrew that, not the church, but the warehouse. And then we put a tent outside. And people would come from 5 o'clock in the morning lining up. And we'd just get them in, 
give them the word, worship and whatnot, and get, get the next group in. And we were so good at it in that movement of people because they were so hungry for something that would uh, empower them to apply. And I said, wow, can you imagine if every church was just filled with hungry people looking to learn something so that they can go back out and chain society. I want to just share this with you. And I like uh, something that was said earlier that, that Jesus is the, um, the, the God of transforming not just people, but transforming places. And when we built our present building, we had continued the process. When we opened it up, we opened it up on New Year's Eve, 2001. And we had the lobby, the sanctuary, and eight bathrooms that didn't work. And it was a snowstorm of six feet of snow. And we had 80% attendance in each service. And I knew it was going to be a wonderful experience in this new building because I saw that people continued that same hunger. And there's something I want to share with you that just really changed my life. It's taken from the passage in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. And it's the second half of it. And it basically says that for he maketh his sun to shine, to rise, or I'll, I'll just paraphrase it. He makes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. And he causes his rain to fall on the just and the unjust. And I said, well, here is God pouring out his rain, his sunshine, the ingredients that would empower the unjust, to be productive, just like he would cause the just to be productive. And you see, when I got saved, God had to tilt the needle all the way to the other side. So I got saved in the Pentecostal church. Everything was sin. When I came home, I threw everything out. I kept my wife. The TV was a one-eyed demon. I threw that away. I had a collection of uh, albums, jazz albums. I'm a jazz buff. I had a collection that dated back to, to the 1940s, Charlie Parker, King Pleasure, Moody's Mood for Love, Miles. And, 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 and I was so filled with the love of God and, 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 and Jesus. And so I went home and I had to get rid of all sin. So I took that collection of albums, and I couldn't, my wife said, well, at least give them away, because I got saved in January. By the time I finished with her, she had to get saved by March, because I terrified her so bad by my change. So I took it, I said, I can't give it away, because I'll be giving away sin. So I took the albums, and I stacked them up by the garbage can, and I remember that morning, because the garbage truck came, and the garbage men were so excited. <laughs> and they were just going through the album. And I'm standing, looking out the window, feeling so holy, so pure, so righteous, so close to God. <laughs> then years later, I realized I was just stupid. <laughs> I've since tried to reconstruct that collection. But in my zeal without knowledge, I just... I just didn't get it. But God had to do that for me. I, you see, I was radically extreme when I was a sinner, but he knew he had to send the needle all the way over. And I was in a group that Jesus was coming in a few weeks after I got saved. <laughs> and after he kept putting it off, I said, well, maybe I better make some plans for down here. But I needed that time. I needed that time because God would, would just develop some understandings inside of me. And, and during that time, why I raised the, 
is because I just thought God was good to the just. I didn't, I didn't have the notion that God could be good to sinners. Okay? So it was, it was them and us. And, and I, I, I felt that anything good that happened to unbelievers was the devil. And then I had to wrestle with every good and perfect gift comes down from God above. And I said, okay. I said, I didn't, I didn't see it that way because after a while, we were just the group that was getting together to wait for Jesus to come, and then we were out of here. But my theology had to shift as, as, as God, my understanding of God, continued to, to expand. Because, you know, we can put them into a little theological box, you see. And you cannot have CCDA without a shift in your theology. And I needed that shift. And when I read this verse slowly and carefully, I realized that there are two things working in this world. There is God's common grace and God's saving grace. And I realize that because God is love, because his nature is one of kindness and compassion, and he has to be consistent and true to his own nature, even though people can be mean and honoring, even though people can be unjust, God still, out of his goodness and kindness, pours his grace upon me. And I realized that had it not been for the grace of God before I got saved, that grace that was leading me to salvation. See, because I got stories. I remember I was 14 years old and I was working on the back of a, of a truck uh, helping unload and the truck was a little too far from the warehouse. I was a young kid, didn't know any better. And and uh, we were trying to signal to the driver to back the truck up closer. So I'm standing on the back of the truck, up on the truck, and I peek around the side of the truck to tell him, come on. And he started backing up. And no sooner he backed up a bit, I felt my head pinned between the truck and the brick wall of the building. Everything went dark. Next thing I know, I ran and my friends who were out there, they were laughing because they didn't understand what had happened. And I ran in the house, pulled out a Bible, and I prayed because I understood that I almost lost my life. And somehow I connected that God was involved with that. Yeah. I went back outside because this factory was across the street from the home in which I lived, the house that I lived in. I went back outside, and my friends, they, was, they were still laughing. I said, what were you guys laughing at? Said, they said, we were wondering why you were running around the truck like that. I said, you have no idea what just happened. So I went to the truck driver. I said, I said why did you... Stop the truck. He said, I figured I hit the wall because I pressed the gas and it wouldn't go anymore. See, I know that there is a grace active in human society. But I just couldn't figure that God would be that way. But then I saw that verse and I understood. I understood. That God's common grace was upon all of us. That comes out of his love for people. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. He just loves people. And because of that love for people. And out of his nature. He dispenses to human society. Something called common grace. It is that 
goodness of God, that kindness of God that he dispenses to deal, to not only lead us ultimately to Christ, to saving grace, but to deal with the conditions that have come into human society as a result of the fall. And then I understood that his common grace is dispensed through social institutions. Government is ordained by God to maintain order to serve the people. That's what government is for. Health care, court systems, all of the hospitals, educational systems, all of these social institutions are designed to dispense God's common grace. And it's not until I saw it like that, and I have to say that, that I read something that Ray Bakke had wrote, and I said, wow, that's, that's it. But I had to come back and, 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 and diagram it. So all of these social institutions that exist in our society, banking institution, educational system, and I heard something, some talk about the educational system, and those of you that read the news, you know what we're dealing with in New York City to turn it around. But these are all vehicles through which God dispenses his common grace to the people. And as as much as, as there are institutions that dispense his common grace, there are institutions that dispense his saving grace. And that's the church. Okay? But you see, with the mindset of separation of church and state, and I'm getting ready to go to heaven in a few weeks, this had no relationship to my thinking as a Christian. The only thing that I was concerned about was this institution, was the church, and whatever happened in its four walls. And the rest of them out here, they were going to hell. That's right. But we, we're going to heaven. I got to know some of the people <laughs> in here. So I got to know some of the personal ambitions that are plaguing the leadership in the body of Christ today. Because where Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you've got to be willing to take up your cross. Deny your personal ambitions and follow me. And he wasn't talking. In fact, let me, let me, let me complete that. He said, he said, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? You see, I was taught that, that was, he was talking to, 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 to sinners. But the context in Matthew 16, he was talking to his staff. So what, what, what was his cross? Because he didn't say take up my cross. He said take up your cross. And what is it, what cross do we as, as those individuals who follow Jesus in a leadership capacity to do his will in the earth? What is that cross? The very cross that he took up. And that is the denial of his own personal ambitions. The willingness to die to personal ambitions so that ministry and people could live. But you see, we live in a society now where the Christian leaders want to be celebrities. Can I behave myself, uh, Dr. Perkins? We want to be superstars. So we put out there 
our fine cars, our big house, as measurements of our spirituality and symbols of our closeness to God. But you see, I saw some unjust people with the same house, the same car, and they were on the expressway to hell. So I said that this cross has to be something other than what some of them are saying. And I found that too many want the crown, but without the cross. They want the power of the resurrection, but without the fellowship of his suffering. So, so God was organizing some things in my mind. These social institutions are ordained by God to dispense his common grace to the people. And this institution dispenses God's saving grace to the people because it's always about the people, not about us. And, and, and when that separation of church and state was in my mind, I, I said, okay, we, we get the people of heaven. We give them God's saving grace. We dispense God's saving grace to the people. But then when I understood that his common grace was dispensed through the social institutions so that the people's needs can be met, whether they know God or not, it changed my thinking. Are y'all with me? I'm not on another planet here. It changed my thinking. See? So now my attention turned from the church a little bit to the social institution. And I found that they weren't doing their job. I found corruption. I found people who were motivated by personal ambitions, and not all of them. I found people who were motivated by personal ambitions as the reason why the people were suffering. So God's common grace, an expression of his love, goodness, and kindness that was meant to, the com- to come to the people to ultimately lead them to his saving grace was being interfered with by the social institutions. And I stood over here at the church and looked over there at the social institutions and said, somebody got to do something about this. Oh, y'all are hearing me tonight, right? But you see, the, the connection wasn't made immediately, so I was over here now understanding this, but saying somebody's got to do something. But at the same time, I was saying, no siento, señor, no es mi trabajo. I'll translate that real quick. It's not my job. (laughs) Until I realize it is my job. See, because unless, and I understood why judgment begins here and not here. I understood why judgment begins at the house of God. Because the house of God not only dispenses God's common grace, but it also upholds his standards. And if the church lowers its standards, downgrades its values, then we allow these social institutions to operate in selfishness, and the people don't get God's common grace, and they'll never even think about coming to his saving grace. And I realized i got to do something. And it shifted my paradigm. It gave me a paradigm shift, theological shift. And I said, this has to hold this, these institutions accountable. Not just take on their role, which some did, and then the church became a social agency and forgot all about saving grace. But to understand this relationship so that we can now challenge these social institutions. And whatever we establish out of the church as power church organization becomes models for the social institutions to understand 
and to be held accountable to. And I tell you, the line between church and state, that imaginary line, was wiped out so fast. And I said, okay, I won't buy into that anymore. I'm going to understand this relationship that God established. And I started teaching it. And I said, church, we are responsible. I said, well, pastor, what are you going to do? What do you want us to do? I said, I'll tell you, I want you with his saving grace to get jobs in the social institutions so that you can be God's individual to hold these institutions accountable to dispense his common grace. We've got 275 law enforcement officers in our church. We've got 460 teachers in our church. We have 10 judges in our church. We have 22 attorneys in our church. And they understand that they have a responsibility to make sure that God's common grace is being dispensed through the social institutions that he ordained. See, I, I thought government was the devil. And I understood why the Bible said, pray for those in the government. <laughs> then I understood that it was ordained by God. And I understood that when the wicked are in authority, the people mourn. But when the righteous are in power, the people rejoice. Why? Because when the righteous are in those social institutions, that righteousness will lead them to maintain the purpose for those institutions. And that is to dispense God's common grace to the people. See, we wouldn't be here having this meeting and there would be no such organization as CCDA if this was doing what it's supposed to do. But because we understand that there's a fallen world and people are looking to satisfy their personal ambitions and they will use their power to their personal benefit and not for the people. And we have to, we have a responsibility to get involved. And make changes. I uh, was at a meeting that came, and I'll share this with you. I flew back from Singapore in time of ministry in February, and as soon as I landed, I had a call from the senator's office, two senators' office, governor's office, and and Washington and community activists who said, we want to hold a rally at your church. I said, whoa, what rally? He said, well, someone is about to buy the housing development that your church, the community that your church is in. I said, really? He said, I didn't know it was for sale. He said, yeah, but the people who want to buy it, are about to pay over a billion dollars for it. And if they get it, they will convert it into high-priced luxury condominiums and displace the seniors, workers, low-income folks, who are benefiting from the largest Minchalama program in the country. Some of you know about Minchalama program, government subsidized housing. And he said, we can't let that happen. Now, I'm one for development. I'm one for progress. But I'm not one for displacing people. 
So I said, well, let me find out more about this. But there wasn't enough time. So I let them have the meeting and the press conference at our church. And then I got a call from the New York Times said, well, what, where do you stand on this? I said, I don't have enough information to stand anywhere. And within a month's time, I got a call from those who wanted to buy it. And they said, Reverend, we'd like to talk to you. And they had already gotten one of these involved. So I said, well, let's, let's talk about what you're trying to do. He said, well, we just want your endorsement. I said, hold it. You don't get it just like that. I need to understand what you're trying to do, how it's going to impact our community. It's all right, Reverend, we'll, we'll, we'll let you know the details after. I said, no, 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 the devil is in the details. If, so if you don't want me to see the details now, then I know who you're hiding. <laughs> so I said, so I got my attorneys, a team together, and we ripped the stuff apart. And the, the, the newspapers and the community were saying, well, what are you going to do, Reverend? Are you, you going to endorse this thing? What are you, you going to do? I said, I'm, I'm, I'm in discovery and investigation. What are you going to do, Reverend? I'm in discovery and investigation. And finally, I said, I can't. I can't endorse this. Because the people are going to suffer. You're going to displace people. You're going to have people with nowhere to go. And you're, we're going to experience an economic gentrification. I said, I, I can't do that. Well, Reverend, I'm sorry to hear that. Sorry to hear that you can't do that. And I felt that was the end of it. Then I got a call from my attorney. He said, Pastor. He said, I, I've got some information for you. I said, what about? He said, well, you know, you know the deal that's going on there. I said, well, I told him that, you know, I'm out. He said, no, but you don't understand. I said, what? He said, they made me an offer. They brought it to you through me. So I said, well, I was curious. <laughs> I said, well, what's the offer? When he told me, I sat down. I cannot share with you what that offer is, but it will come out in a couple of years. But I sat down because I, I discovered how valuable in dollars the influence that God gave me. I'll try that one more time. The influence that God gave me for his kingdom. That was the first time in my life that I ever had someone put a dollar amount. I thought about that amount. So I could buy me my own island. I can't tell you. I want to tell you. I want to tell you so bad. And I said, Counselor, you and I have been friends for 25 years and you know me. Can you, in all good conscience, advise me to accept this offer? He said, no, I can't. I said, then you understand, as you've understood all these years, that my integrity is not for sale. Amen. He said, so does that mean that you're turning it down? I said, yes. He said, well, you've been consistent for 
25 years that I've known you. When I hung up that phone, I felt good. I felt good. And I didn't, I didn't just throw out jazz albums. Because <laughs> the voice on that side of my shoulder is telling me, stupid. <laughs> but I felt good. Then the newspapers came, and word got out that I, that they don't know I turned down an offer, but that I pulled out. I said, God, you've got, well, I, I could have paid for my church and build 10 more at the same price. I said, okay, Lord, it's yours. And it died. At least I thought it died. And then I got a phone call <laughs> three weeks ago. And the right people are now at the table. And they said, Reverend, we talked to the politicians, we talked to the community leaders and said, we, were, we, we understand that this deal cannot go through without your involvement. But instead of giving you an affordability plan, we're asking you come up with a plan that will protect the people. And we can get together and work. And I moved from endorsement, and I hope I'm spelling this right, to partnership. Because my integrity was not for sale. And now 15,000 people are going to experience God's common grace because I understood and accepted my responsibility. Because Jesus didn't call me just to transform individuals called me to transform communities. I'm going to finish with this, according to that clock. Taxes. This is for all you pastors out in the audience. Taxes were designed to support these social institutions. Taxes. Now you could say taxes have been unfair and the golden goose eats too much. But taxes. And on this side, we got tax too. It's called a tithe. Are you with me? And just like there are folks on this side, who want the benefits offered by the social institutions but don't want to pay for it. We got folks on this side that want the benefits of the Saving Grace Institution but they don't want to pay for it. And I tell you as a former banker. This side of the equation fluctuates just in the, in, in the 1900s anywhere from 30% to 92% early on. But God in his goodness for the past several thousand years has maintained the same rate of 10%. And whereas the government 
doesn't trust you. So they deduct it before you get the check. God, to, to allow you the opportunity to experience the full expression of his saving grace, allows you out of your own volition to believe in him. And I say this because if God's people understood this, and we wouldn't have to negotiate over chicken dinners and cake sales. But just like you have tax evasion, you got tithe evasion. But can you imagine if we fully understood this relationship? And God's people obeyed God. And we can hold the institutions accountable and experience God's common grace and his saving grace. And I'm through. God bless you. Good night. Stay here for a second. How many of you learned something tonight? I think you just expanded your congregation by a few thousand. <laughs> now, while we're at it, stay standing for a second, because after uh, the end of your talk, I think we're going to have to redo that offering tonight. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Let's give it up for God through Dr. Bernard. Amen? Let's give, let's give the Lord a hand. God bless you. Thank you, yes. you can have a seat. Now, I'm only going to erase this part right here. But I just have a few announcements. Number one, uh, if you were smart, and I know you are, I would go out tonight and get about 40 or 50 copies of that message so you can give to your leaders. Okay? You know what I'm talking about? Do you think this would make a difference in their lives? And you might need to get the DVD about this one, you know, so you could get, all, you could get the board and all that, and, and he's a handsome man, too. So, okay, Dove is out there. You can get all those message, uh, messages, and so I want you to make sure you do that. Now, also, uh, right after we're done here, how many of you are organizational members of CCDA? Raise your hands. Now, some of you don't know, but... If you think you are, you know, raise, now if you got a little ticket that says you are, raise your hand, okay? We have a reception for all of our organizational members. There are two kinds of memberships we have in the association. One is an individual membership. When you sign up for the conference, you become an individual member of CCDA, okay? So all of you, whether you want to or, I mean, whether you knew it or not, you became an individual member of CCDA when you uh, signed up uh, for this conference. But many of you are organizational members, and we have other benefits that we're developing for you. And so tonight, we want to just tell you thank you for, for becoming an organizational member. We have a reception for you right uh, out here in the Rose Garden Room, uh, where we had our reception last night. Okay, so that's going to be great, and we invite you to come right there. Now, the other thing is we have a lot of resources at this conference for you in our exhibitors. Okay, there are two floors of exhibits right outside here that many of you have had a chance to go to, but there's a whole bunch of exhibits down on the second floor. Anybody know that? Yeah. Now, I want you to do me a favor uh, so that they will come back next year. Go, to, go down there and, and just go and find out who they are and what those ministries are, and I think you'll have a great experience learning about uh, these new exhibits, okay, and the kind of resources that they provide, okay? So, exhibits, right? Go check them out. Here's the next thing. Uh, some of you are part of what we call this new generation or young leader network of CCDA. Anybody uh, participate in that? A few of you? Come on now. There's a few of you. Uh, there's going to be more after I make this announcement here. 
Uh, Friday night, tomorrow night, we're going to have a little uh, get-together for you after the salsa dancing, okay, uh, at AJ's. Now, this is after the bar is closed, okay, so don't get too excited, all right? So at AJ's, we're going to have that. Now, so all those of you that have participated in that Young Leaders Network, here's the last announcement. Tomorrow morning at, this is like in honor of Dr. Bernard, uh, tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., we're going to go for another run. About 25 of us went for a run this morning. Stand up if you went for a run this morning. Stand up. Now, all right. I think you were the one that was beating everybody, right? Right here, right in the front. I got to tell you about two of them, two of the runners. One, uh, uh, the, the mayor from Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Where is he? There's the mayor from Hop. Okay, here he is. Now, can I stand up? I want you to stand up. You see what he's wearing right now? That's what he ran in this morning. He didn't have any running gear, so he ran in that same outfit. So some of you all saying, I can't go run in the morning because I didn't bring no... If he could wear that, come on. So tomorrow morning, come on out there and run. Now, the second person I want to just kind of... Eric Iverson. Uh, where's Eric? Eric... He was the last one in. I got, I'm sorry, Eric, I got to tell on you. But he ran three miles today. All right, so let's give it up for Eric. All right. Well, tomorrow morning at 7, we're going to meet out front again. And we are going to do a run underneath this uh, track that's under the arch. It's beautiful. And if you want to just come and walk, you can do that too, okay? How many of you can do that? Anybody? 7 a.m. tomorrow? Come on, anybody? A couple of you? Oh, okay, we'll see. We'll see. All right. So, uh, it, but it's going to be great. But uh, I will have a gift for you if you come out tomorrow, all right? It don't, don't matter what it is. If you want to know what it is, you've got to come out. Did you all have a good time today? Did you learn something today? Man, isn't God good? And we're even going to end early tonight. Isn't that great? So some of you all need to go home or go to your rooms and go to bed because, you know, you're looking tired. Father, you're a good God, and we thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>